Hi everyone, welcome to Ilham and welcome to this afternoon's talk, May 13 by Onkar Jin. Karjin, or KJ for short, is a researcher, writer, and strategist. He was previously a public affairs analyst before plunging deep into the tech industry, working on blockchain, fintech, and tech ethics as a strategy lead. He graduated from Yale University with a BA in history, focusing on genocide and ethnic conflict in Southeast Asia. Today, he will be examining May 13th's enduring power in our collective consciousness, contending with ideas of the value of truth and reflecting on the incident now in a time of Gaza and social media. Please welcome Onkar Jin. <clears throat> Hello. Okay, great. So in many ways, um, I, I think I've been actually writing this lecture in some form or another for the past 15 years. Um, as a teenager, I first had my real brush with May 13 when I wanted to go to Bursay. I mean, that will expose my age for some of you. Lah. <laughs> so I, I had a huge argument with my parents <laughs> because I think, you know, as most parents, they're like, oh my God, Bursay, oh, you'll riot later something might, terrible might happen. And I remember my mom becoming very quiet in the car. You know, she's quite a chatty auntie, you know, always going on about what plants she's planting now and how to get away with luggage allowance on AirAsia, that kind of thing. So, but she was very quiet then. And I remember she said to me that, she said to me this, I lived in the servants' quarter of a British family near where Glen Eagles Ampang is now. The Angmors were away for summer, so when the violence broke out, all the neighbourhood servants huddled together in one house. There was a Malay and a Chinese village nearby. I heard the adults whisper about the killings, and there was smoke and fire in the air. My father and a few others, they broke curfew to go to Hok Chun, which was then a big warehouse with a zinc roof, and now today it's a supermarket. And... He returned pale and shocked after witnessing shootings and looting on the streets. After a few days, everyone went back to their houses, but we never talked about that day again. Uh, that year, I decided not to go to Bursay, not because I was afraid something might happen, but because when I heard the vulnerability and fear that made my mom's voice quiver, I couldn't have it in my heart to push on. But then the next year, I went to Bursay anyway. La. <laughs> so, I'm telling you this story um, for two reasons, really. Firstly, because I want to tell you that since that day, 15 years ago, I've been thinking about May 13. So there's, you know, there's a meme on TikTok asking, oh, how often do you think about the Roman Empire? And a lot of white men basically say, oh, every day or something like that. And I think for me, May 13 is kind of my Roman Empire. Um, you know, I, I thought of May 13, um, I remember in Sajarah class when I saw this picture in the Sajarah textbook, and it had a car burning in the streets of KL. There was no text, there was no explanation, there was... It was just like car burning in kale, small caption. And I asked my Sajara teacher, what's this? And she just told me, something start by it out. And I thought of May 13 when I entered university and I chose to pursue history. And even today, I think of May 13 when I see the atrocities in Gaza unfolded before us live in social media. I mean, for a while, uh, 13 May was actually my phone password. So that was quite embarrassing to talk about. <laughs> but I've never quite summoned up the will and courage to talk about May 13. Because to me, what can I say? What can anyone really say in the face of May 13? So the second reason I tell you the story about my mom is because my mom did not really speak of May 13 before this incident. And afterwards, unless I pushed her, she didn't talk of May 13 either. Which is to say, May 13 was only brought up as a warning. And that is the form in which we recognize May 13 today. It is a warning. It is a weaponized bogeyman 
from the deepest, darkest recesses of suppressed history brought up by parents to terrify their children, by governments to tell you don't play play, and today, revived by social media influences on TikTok to sway elections. Don't do this, or else, May 13th. Don't do that, May 13th. Today, I want to address both these things. I want to talk about May 13th, and I want us to try to treat May 13th as more than a warning. So, um, allow me to offer a brief, if painfully simplified summary of what we do know of the facts in history and what has been proposed. So, um, you know, let's begin with what everyone agrees on. So, there was an election in 1969. It was preceded by fierce campaigning and it delivered a shock to the alliance government. Gurakan, which was then an opposition party, challenged MCA and they took Penang. The PPP, uh, they were relevant then, <laughs> almost won Perak but sh was short of two seats in the state assembly. There were outbreaks of violence prior where in one incident, a Malay political worker was killed in Penang and in KL, a Chinese Labour Party activist was shot and killed by police. So, there were also victory processions on May 11 by opposition parties, DAP and Gerakan, but they were largely reported by foreign correspondents to be peaceful with police supervision. On May 12, Amno Youth announced that they would have a procession, a counter-procession, which would start from then Selangor Menteri Besar Harun Idris's residence. And many were brought not just from KL, but from rural areas, particularly Morib, which was Harun's constituency, into KL to join this procession. Then, on the 13th of May, clashes were reported between members of this procession and bystanders. From there, the clashes spread. A 24-hour curfew was announced on RTM at 7.35 p.m. And later, between 8.30 and 9.30, a shoot-to-kill order was given by the Inspector General of Police as well as the Chief of Armed Forces. The police and army were deployed en masse. By 5 a.m., KL General Hospital had reported 80 dead. Over 450 houses were built and over 7,000 were displaced, becoming refugees in Modeka Stadium, Chinwu Stadium, and Shaw Road School. So, the final official tally was 196 dead, but many independent reporters believe the death toll to be as many as 10 times higher. So what happened and why? There are basically three views. The first, which is the official account, blames the opposition parties and with them, the Malayan Communist Party and secret societies. Uh, the National Operations Council report reads, um, the eruption on violence on 13th of May was the result of an interplay of forces. These include the incitement, intemperate statements and provocative behaviours of certain racialist party members and supporters during the recent general election and the part played by the Malayan Communist Party and secret societies in inciting racial feelings and suspicion. Okay. Tunku Abdul Rahman would actually double down on this and he blamed as well the opposition parties as well as the influence of communists. But in truth, this theory is scoffed at and most international observers because duly noted the BRICS pan, Gerald Templer, the emergency, the subsequent crackdown on the left had pretty much weakened deeply Malaysia, uh, Malaysia of any communist influence. So that brings us to the second theory. And the second theory is posited by Kwa Kya Song. And he basically blames Razak for everything, as in Tun Abdul Razak. So Kwa Kya Song argues that the riots were a premeditated coup d'etat orchestrated by then Prime, Prime Minister Tun Abdul Razak in cahoots with Amno Youth, the army, and the police. Um, this thesis basically relies very heavily on declassified documents from the Public Record Office in London, 
mostly observations by foreign embassy operatives and intelligence corp correspondents. It basically asserts that the clashes were intentionally started to topple Rahman and bring into power Raza. And basically, it frames it as a battle between an ascendant capitalist Malay class versus the old aristocratic royalists. But the thing is, Kua Kya Song's source work is almost entirely dependent on the declassified documents, which are very much British, from the British point of view. And yes, there's meticulous analysis, and he makes these arguments very confidently, but much of this evidence is circumstantial, and there's no real evidence that can definitively implicate the intent of sparking a riot by Razak. At best, it basically says that Razak took full advantage of the chaos, and he took control of the reins of power, and this much we can say is true because Rahman was very clearly sidelined after 1969. But taking advantage of such a situation is not proof of intent. There is a motive, there's a lot to gain, but in this murder mystery, there is no murder weapon with fingerprints. There is no smoking gun. So, that brings us to the third theory, uh, which is that Um, May 13 was a spontaneous outburst of sectarian violence that had deep roots in a deeply divided society. One that had not healed from the wounds of the Malayan Union, the emergency period, and the haphazard rammed through forming of fed the Federation of Malaysia. I mean, these tensions are, of course, undeniable. These very same rifts are still with us today. We understand them intimately. But... A dry forest in a severe drought may catch fire easily, but a spark is always needed. That spark can come from a strike of lightning or the strike of an arsonist match. So where do we really stand? So let me make it clear that I am by no means an authority on May 13. But the truth is, by any measure, we do not know. We do not really know, and we cannot know, because there's no such thing as an authority on May 13. The ability to become an authority, to be able to back one's assertion with carefully, diligently assembled, verified evidence, cross-checked, peer-reviewed, internationally recognized, of the ability to be sure it has been denied, it has been systematically denied, suppressed, forgotten, or simply left to rot over the decades. And this is the harsh truth of where we are today. In the words of Hannah Arendt, facts and events are infinitely more fragile things than axioms, theories. Factual truth is in great danger of being maneuvered out of the world for a time and possibly forever. So, if the facts are denied to us, what are we left with then? We can turn to memory. In the years since the shattering of Amno's long reign, new spaces for discourse have opened up. You know, in 2019, there was a published, uh, there was a published series of oral history interviews um, by the Star with survivors of May 13. That same year, Malaysia Kinney had a whole interactive news article with lots of interviews. Um, that same year, 50 Years of Silence, which was a documentary telling the story of one family in Kampung Baru was released. And in 2020, um, first published in Chinese, later translated into other languages, Afterlife, containing oral histories of May 13, was published by Garak Budaya. So compared to the deafening silence of the past half century, this can be re really considered an outpouring, a flood of oral history. And oral history is important. I mean, throughout time, where written texts have crumbled or just not existed, narratives spread by spoken word have stepped in. They hold great power. By their very nature, it allows us to capture one thing that written records can only approximate, the voice, the tone, the rhythm. The past is literally given a voice, a voice that can tremble with anger, a voice that can weep, a voice that can lilt with sarcasm. But it, and, and in so doing, in... I was too, 
I too was frustrated with the silence of the archive. I too went searching for these oral histories, for voices of the past. And over the years, I've made it a point that whenever I meet anyone who was born before 1969, and hopefully I didn't misjudge, <laughs> they would be willing to tell me what they remember of it. So one of my first interviews was when I was 17. Um, when I was that age, I had a tuition teacher. He lived in the old low-rise walk-up flat in Churras, and he taught me math. And to be honest, I was a terrible student. I hated math. Uh, so I was always making up excuses like, oh, stomach ache, uh, I feel sick today. And one day I decided, okay, this is how I'm going to stop him from teaching me math. I'm going to ask him about May 13 and hope he goes on and on. Um, and when I asked him about May 13, he opened up as if he had been waiting for someone to ask him that question his entire life. And he said, when I was 15 years old, I was living in Kampong Baru where the violence began. We were very afraid and hiding with almost nothing to eat. One of the older Chinese boys invited me. Yo, come on, let's go and get some chicken. Meaning, steal a chicken from one of the, the back of one of the houses in Kampung Baru. And it seems so stupid now, but I actually followed him. We ran around the house, making a big fuss and noise. We managed to catch a chicken, and we were trying to slaughter it when a soldier grabbed me. He looked at me and he said, you are lucky I'm not from the peninsula or you'll be dead. And he let him go and my tuition teacher survives to this day. So some years later, I was conducting oral history interviews for real, you know, more professionally as part of a research grant. I revisited my tuition teacher to record his experience on an audio recorder. He didn't remember that he told me the story before. And more crucially, when he recounted the story, many details had changed. The time of day was different. The nature of the theft, instead of stealing chicken, it became rice. And then there was some older Chinese boy disappeared, you know. So despite my written notes from our first conversation, I was like, hey, I have notes here. Am I being gaslit here? Um, his memory had transformed. So memory is a fickle thing. And to understand the fluid nature of memory, we can turn to the neuroscientist Joseph Ledoux's experiments on memory recall. So typically, the way we understand memory is, you know, you have files in a file cabinet or the, the more updated version is a hard drive, right? So, yeah, yeah, sometimes you pull up the file and uh, the writing is quite chaka ayam, you know, the, the writing has faded, it's very dusty but it's essentially the same file that you're pulling from every time. But this is actually very far from the scientific truth on the nature of memory. So, I have a nifty little diagram to explain this complicated science experiment. Bear with me. So, basically what Ledoux did, did was he had a rat. He plays a tone, toot, and then bzz, the rat gets shot. So the rat is like, oh my God, Scary shot. So the next time he has a rat, uh, he plays the sound again. I mean, is this not working? And then, without the shot coming, the rat is already panicking. It's like having Vietnam War flashbacks, you know? So basically, the rat has formed this memory that when you hear the tone, here comes the shot. Now, this is nothing groundbreaking. You know, we, we know we all, most of us know Pavlov and all those kind of exper experiments. Now, the trick is, is that he was actually testing a drug, a drug that interfered with the formation, the creation of new memories. So, what he did, he takes the rat. He plays the sound. He shocks the rat. Toot, bzz, and then he injects the drug. And then, basically, he interrupts the formation of that new memory. Now, so the next time, the rat, hears the toot. It's supposed to be, oh my God, help me. This time, nope. It's like, la di da di da Oh, nice music in the background. Okay. So, 
here's the part that gets really interesting. So you take a rat, and this time he said, okay, so I've proven now this drug can mess with the formation of new memories, the creation of memory. Now he takes an old rat. Okay, I just put the sign there. Uh, just don't, don't, don't cancel me, please. Um, so he gets an old rat, he plays the toot, and obviously this rat is a veteran. It's gone through this so many times. It's been shocked so many times. It knows what's coming. It hears the tone and it's like, oh my God, help me. Okay, now this time, he takes the old rat, he plays the toot. It's panicking. So he knows that when it's panicking, it actually is remembering, oh my God, what comes next is the shock. It's recalling this memory. And then he injects the rat. Now, remember, this drug is supposed to mess with creation of memory, not recall. So, the next time he exposes the rat to the sound, he thinks it's, yeah, it should be panicking. This memory is already formed. I'm just messing, I'm not messing with any creation of memory. But no, the rat has forgotten. Though, though that memory was already formed. And They've done this experiment multiple times now in all sorts of controls and change tone and tu ti ta ta I mean, they've, 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 they've really done the science on this. But the big takeaway from this is that the, fall, the recall of memory, when you remember something, when you're trying to pull something from your cabinet and when you're creating or forming a new memory, based on the signs, they are the same thing. Creation, any act of remembering is an act of creation. You don't pull, pull up an old file, you're writing the file anew every time you write it, every time you remember, which has very big implications for the fallibility of memory. It's why, you know, old couples get into arguments about, no, I remember this and all that. <laughs> They're both right, in probably. So, um, so what's the point of all this talking about rats and tones and memories? I mean, it essentially means that memory, like my teacher's recollection of May 13, is fluid, it's fragmented, and it is fundamentally an act of creation. It means that, yes, while these voices, these oral histories, they are powerful and they speak to personal truths, they are ultimately very far from any kind of objective truth. And this is especially so when there is so little independent documentary evidence to check against. In isolation, oral histories and memory, they run the risk of becoming folklore. And look, there's nothing wrong with folklore. We all know that ghost stories, myths and legends are very powerful. But if our objective, if our quest for May 13 is to know what happened and why and who caused this tragedy, if our clawing at the past is an attempt to excavate the whys and hows, then through oral history, we are no closer to it than before. So we are living today under a regime that seeks to bury May 13 as deeply as possible. The truth is not going to come from the government because the reality is that the perpetrators and the beneficiaries of May 13 still walk in the corridors of power. And increasingly, because of time, because of death, any idea of truth, even the personal truth to oral histories, will be denied to us by the passage of time. But it's here where I have to take a step back and really question, why do we need to know for sure what is the value of the truth. What are we looking for? Justice? What, 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 what is justice? So last week, there was an op-ed, I think it's FMT and some other places, by Dr. Sharifa Munira Al-Atas. And she urged that the Sungai Buloh May 13th Cemetery it needs to be preserved and needs to be memorialized. But what are we preserving? What are we memorializing? What narrative are we seeking to impose to impart lessons? What truth? Whose truth? And the truth is, if you look at the history of Malaysia, the idea of truth has long been weaponized by the powers that be. The government claimed to possess the truth in the National Operation Council report. 
The idea of a single authoritative truth has long been wielded to label others as liars and to maintain control. We have heard that refrain again and again. I, the authority, am sole purveyor of the truth. All else is libel, sedition, defamation. And yet, there are, a lot, there are so many of us, including myself, who are still caught up in this idea of finally finding the truth behind May 13. And, you know, I've mentioned I've somewhat obsessed with May 13. You know, it led me down this rabbit hole where I became interested in ethnic conflict, in genocide, oral history, memory. And I really was obsessed with it because I was looking for a cause. I mean this in both senses of the word. I was looking for something to dedicate myself to, but I was looking for a cause of like, why are things this way? You know, why is Malaysia this way? How did the NEP come about? Why is Raza, you know, how did Raza come in power? You know, why is the phrase Malaysia for Malaysians poison? But I think in so doing, I fell to this great temptation, which is the temptation to see May 13 as a moment of original sin. I mean, you have to admit, there's a real draw to pointing at May 13 and saying, oh, this is it. This is the turning point. This is where it began, you know, if only... You know, there's like some kind of fantasy where we can hop into a time machine and then if we prevent the riots, then oh, all will be well. We'll be living in a utopia. Tunku Abdul Rahman will be reigning for three decades. And, and you know, Operasi Lalang, blah, blah, ISA, you know, we'll be put back into Pandora's box and happily ever after, kumbaya. <laughs> I mean, yes, I'm not saying no doubt that May 13 is important. No doubt, many things would never be the same after. And no doubt, May 13 was egregious. But May 13 doesn't stand alone when we consider the um, admittedly rather short arc of Malaysian history. When we consider the Maria Hertog riots of 1950, of 1964 racial riots in Singapore, of the emergency of the 1986 Sabah Silent Riots, or the 2001 Kampung Medan incident. And increasingly, I am personally convinced, and this is my personal opinion, that no good is going to come of insisting for a definitive truth. I'm increasingly of the opinion that as our space for dialogue expands, we have to be wary of monumentalizing May 13 as a kind of final fulcrum upon all of Malaysian history turns. You know, in 1992, Francis Fukuyama, when he observed the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, he famously remarked that we had reached the end of history. You know, he lamented, oh, the era of ideological struggle is over. Now we'll just be presented with an endless series of technical problems. And of course, when we hear it today in this era that we live in, we're like, oh, what an idiot. <laughs> and I think in a, in a similar vein, I think we, we have to resist the temptation to label May 13 as the end of Malaysian history, right? It, because that temptation comes with an obsession with grand narrative, with political players. It, you know, it's this realm where we want to blame Razak as the mastermind, where somehow Lim Kit Siang is the puppet master of May 13, although he wasn't even there. Um, this is where we will be mired in a swamp of competing, contested narratives and an ever-revolving blame game. It's weaponization, the realm of the bogeyman. When we make May 13 a monument, its towering figure casts shadows that can obscure more than enlighten. So, if we are denied facts, if memory is fallible, and truth, justice is all the then what do we have? <laughs> you know, I think of the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo in Argentina, whose children were disappeared by the death squads of dictator Jorge Rafael Videla. You know, these mothers of the, Cinco, uh, of the Plaza de Mayo, um, for their disappeared sons and daughters, for years they stood in that plaza come rain and shine. Initially, their demands were not revolution or re regime change. They simply wanted acknowledgement, the recognition that their children had existed. They had not simply vanished, that their state of non-existence was not an adjective, it was a verb. They were murdered. Dibunuh bukan terbunuh by somehow. 
And I also think of the mothers of Tiananmen Square today because they continue to wait. And they too are quickly passing under the weight of time. Who is going to remember their sons and daughters when they pass? If one day, by revolution or by accident, those names finally come to light, Jiang Jielan, Wang Nan, Yang Minghu, what meaning would they even hold? For so many survivors of genocide or human rights atrocities, justice is not what they dream of. Accountability for these people is not punishment, but literally an accounting, a balance sheet, who lived, who died. So what of May 13 then? We don't even know the names of all the victims or how many victims there really are. And in the soul, in the face, in the face of this silence of the archives, in the face of the fallibility of memory, in the face of weaponization of history, what can we really do? To be honest, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if the answer I came to personally after years of grappling this, with this question is going to be adequate. In fact, I know it's not adequate, but perhaps nothing is going to be adequate. But I can share with you this, my own way of coping and how I have chosen to process this question. So it really started in an accident of sorts. So in 2018, I was looking for a gift for an artsy-fartsy friend of mine. So I decided, oh, you know, I'm going to be hipster. I'm going to look at the antique shops at the flea market of M Corp Mall. I think just by entering M Corp Mall, I lowered the average age of the customers quite a bit. Lah. <laughs> so anyway, so I was like choking in dust when I stumbled on this poster. Rumah terang, hidup riang, semenjak merdeka, lebih daripada 1,089 kampung telah mendapat bekalan elektrik. It's basically an election poster touting the success of the Alliance government in bringing electricity to kampongs. Bosatu Sokong Tunku. It's from 1969. So I never meant it for it to be a thing, but somehow from then on, I just started collecting anything that I could find that was related to May 13. Then it kind of spiraled from there and it became, doesn't have to be May 13, as long as the year 1969, that's fine. So I collected first day cover stamps, electricity bills, lottery tickets, horse race tickets, police magazines, company newsletters. You know, I, I call them artifacts, but really most people call it junk. Lah. So, you know, try that next time your partner or spouse tells you to get rid of your old stuff. You are not a hoarder, you're a curator of artifacts. So, anyway, as this collection or pile of junk grew, I saw parallels to Orhan Pamuk's Museum of Innocence. So the Museum of Innocence is a novel by the Turkish Nobel-winning novelist Orhan Pamuk. And basically in this novel, uh, long story cut short, the main character is super in love with this person. They are star-crossed, they never really get together. And at the end of the novel, he's like, oh, I'm so sad. We're never getting together, ever get together again. Um, so, and what he does is he has this house with all these objects that he looks upon, he, every object holds some memory for him about, it reminds him of her, right? And he then turns it into a museum. A museum of innocence with all these objects becoming the artifacts on display. And today there's an actual museum of innocence in Istanbul where they use real objects to tell this fictional story, love story. So... In this museum, like ordinary objects are like a cigarette bud, a ticket stub. I mean, really, it's junk. <laughs> but they take on a profound meaning when they are placed in the context of this story. A simple comb becomes a symbol of love's love and yearning. And when viewed in isolation, they might seem trivial. But within the narrative framework of the museum, they become vessels of memory and emotion. So for May 13, we don't have anything as neat as like an award-winning novel to ground our experience. We only have fragments and we have very contested narratives. But for me, and I hope that for many people, this is enough. The mere framing of these objects as coming from the year 1969 is enough for me to transform them from trash to vessels of memory. Orhan Pamuk said, that real museums are places where time is transformed into space. And for me to hold and touch these objects, 
is to experience a kind of intimacy with the past. So, you know, consider this horse race ticket. You know, it's Penang Turf Club. It's the third day of the Singapore Turf Club May meeting. There's a first prize with a guaranteed prize of $600. And the date is 17 May 1969. I mean, that's only four days after the riot. I mean, it makes you wonder, uh, did this event actually happen? Did they, were these pre-sale tickets? Did this person really go to a horse race four days after May 13? Is their gambling addiction that bad? <laughs> I mean, what hopes did they have, right? Or, for example, consider this. It's a first day cover, stamp cover, for Minggu Papaduan 1969. Right? So inside this envelope, there's like this nifty little pamphlet. And this part, I'll read it to you now. There's a small part which I think is delicious, which is, it reads, Every small nation has its problems. And the problem of Malaysia is the problem that faces every nation in Southeast Asia. It is a problem of infiltration, of subversion, of an enemy who can be ruthless and reckless in his efforts at overthrowing democracy. This year, Solidarity Day falls on the 8th of February, which is the 66th birthday of the father of the nation, Tunku Abdul Rahman. May God bless him and grant him long life and happiness and may the country have many more years of his leadership. So just knowing what happens after the aftermath, it just tinges and changes our entire perception of what this is. Or, for example... Look at the oh, go back. Look at these two letters. I mean, it's hard to read, but one is from a son on the 13th of January, 1969. He's basically saying, "Oh, I'm fine in boarding school, or as well that." I mean, they over, you were using ayahanda and anakanda. That's how you know it's the 60s, right? <laughs> um, and then, remarkably, I managed to find the father's reply in another letter. And the reply from the father is basically telling him, and this is on the 22nd of May, 1969, it's telling him, oh, I have a mail order here. It's $150. Please give this to the treasurer of Masjid Jaram. And it makes me wonder, were there other letters in between? Did the son and the father ever discuss May 13? What would have a father said to a growing son in a time of uncertainty and fear? Maybe he would say something very deep. Maybe nothing at all, <laughs> knowing Asian parents. <laughs> but that to me is enough to imbue this scrap of paper with potential. And we already have this in our lives, right? You know, before smartphones, we held on to notes and letters, children's drawings, onto the bantau busok, the certificates, the silly porcelain ducks that our auntie collects or fridge magnets or whatever nonsense thing. And now, somehow, we are driven to capture moments like what we ate today, as if you're going to look at that picture. An accident on the road, or oh, lottery. Or a day where the sunset looks particularly striking. This is all junk to anyone but yourself. But for the objects, but for the, these objects, this junk that I collect, what I ask is that you try an act of imagination. I don't want to go into hocus pocus fluffy zone, but I want to acknowledge that by focusing on the objects when framed by 1969, we can actually enter a conversation with them. Like, um, like with an electricity bill, doesn't it make think, you think of how life had to go on after May 13? Bills still needed to be paid. You know, each item tells a story. And I believe this kind of approach, it allows us to escape the need to know what Razak or Kitsyang or whoever did or did not. Instead, it asks us to consider the ordinary lives of people, their routines, their struggles, their dreams. It is grounding. When language is sometimes not enough, each object is an anchor into not only the past, but the quotidian, the mundane, and the intimate experience of ordinary people far away from the grand machinations of politicians. 
After all, regardless of who planned what, in May 13, in World War I, World War II, in Gaza today, it's ordinary people who suffer for the ambitions of those in power. It is these ordinary people I want to honour, who I want to try to imagine when I hold these objects. Because ultimately, history is not just about dates and events, but about people. And some might call this kind of object communication an act of radical empathy. But as we learned with the two rats of Ledoux and with anything to do with memory, it is ultimately an act of creation. So for the victims of May 13 who have living family, they are at least remembered. For the survivors, May 13 is in their memories. And there's still hope that the efforts of oral historians may give them voice. For these groups, I hope that object-centered histories can complement and enhance our understandings of this past. But there is also another group. At the Sungai Bulo May 13 Cemetery, there are 103 tombstones. Dr. Paul Hyong Hong wrote in her paper that discusses the cemetery, the tombstones are all grey and identical, each inscribed with the name of the deceased, the date of the passing, and a brief acknowledgement. There's no information about the families of members of the deceased. Details an ordinary tombstone would usually display to show that the person was loved and missed. The uniformity of these tombstones strips the victims of their individuality and identity, reduces them to mere victims of violence. And of these 103 headstones, there are 18 of which are, which are ident unidentified. And their tombstones read, unidentified Chinese male, 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 unidentified Chinese female, 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 unidentified Malay male, unidentified Chinese sex unknown, unidentified Chinese sex unknown. And on all of them is written the acknowledgement, courtesy of the Malaysian government. In attempting to speak to objects, in attempting to engage in this act of memory, of creation, my smallest hope is that we can honour these people, not as mere victims of violence, but as real people, perhaps as a father writing a letter to a son, perhaps a gambling addict at the horse races, perhaps as someone who forgot to pay their electricity bill, but real people all the same. Thank you. Um, we now have time for a short Q&A. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please raise your hand and the mic will be handed to you. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, just wanted to ask, do you have a count of how many artifacts you've accumulated so far in 1969? Um, not that much, lah. it's like, I would say in the ballpark of 50. I don't know if that's a lot or very little. <laughs> If anyone wants to donate 1969 things, I'm happy to take them. <laughs> Hi. Uh, when it comes to creation, I'm wondering about this idea that some creations are more dangerous, but also um, less in touch with what actually happened than others mm -hmm. and how you have dealt with that um, with regards to the way that you have 
dealt with these artifacts that you've accumulated and the different ways in which you've approached them and maybe the horse racing ticket is, in fact, someone in the cemetery, but maybe it's just someone entirely different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe it's the perpetrator of violence mm -hmm. and you're left with these different ideas. Um, but when we, we try to bring that and when we encounter the objects, we don't have that grasp and that material backing to make that understanding. Um, so I guess my question then is, what do we do in the face of that? And is the creation enough, um, given that there is this lack of supporting evidence to substantiate it? Yeah, I mean, I, I would venture to say it is not enough. Um, I think that, so, so for example, um, there was actually a movie that was released uh, in September last year um, called Snow in Midsummer. Um, it's a, a Malaysian director uh, made in, uh, released in Taiwan and it's about uh, it is about May 13 actually and it's about um, a family which is separated during May 13 and they basically never find each other again and the second half of the movie is about how this woman now middle aged is still trying to find the disappeared um and so I, I think we, we are in this space where because we have no official recourse, we are in a very different situation from, say, the Holocaust or even East Timor or many of these countries. Because in these countries, there have been official efforts. The powers that be have changed. And there is an effort towards truth and reconciliation there. We do not have that recourse. And I think what that means is that every single little effort now counts. So I don't think the objects are enough, but I think it's my hope that what we cannot do in big steps and bounds, we can do by accumulation, by normalization, by um, complementing and working together um, to of resuscitate these narratives yeah you talked about how um you know the idea of having these uh, normalizing these objects and the power of these objects telling the stories of ordinary people and against that the idea of monumentalization right and so you said well we shouldn't have monuments um but I'm just wondering whether, I mean, because monuments themselves are things which have not, not just a single meaning, and monuments themselves can be contested. But yep. in Malaysia, I feel there's a real lack of monuments, so therefore a real lack of knowledge, a real lack of history mm. um, that can be contested or not contested. Mm -hmm. So do you not feel that if there was at least some kind of public monument to May 13th, that then at least there would be a discussion, a public discussion, as opposed to you know, something in a small space like this, which is not so obvious to the public eye. Yeah, I think I, 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 I definitely um, see where you're coming from. And I think it's a delicate balance between we want to try to open this space for discourse as much as possible. And on the other hand, the, the reason why I am allergic to monuments is because historically speaking, and in Malaysia as well as everywhere, Monuments have been the realm of state narratives. And I think the danger, that the kind of delicate balance that we face, the tightrope that we face, is that the moment any official memorialization happens, it will actually commit a kind of violence to other narratives, to other truths that exist out there. That they will say, now that we've made it official, we are actually memorializing it, this is the truth, guys. Stop talking. And I think that's my fear. Um, and, um, and I think given the climate, I think that's what is likely to happen in any kind of memorialization, that we will see that memorialization is weaponization. But Maybe I I'm, I'm thinking about, um, I mean, there are people here who know better than, than, than me, but 
you know, I was talking last night with some friends about memorializing, for example, the um, the LTT martyrs in, in Sri Lanka. So the Tamil tigers were not uh, allowed to be remembered anymore mm. by people of Pashia of Jaffna. And if you can't remember them, then this, neither is there a place to then have discussion about mm. what happened during the civil war. I, I say this, people can talk about this better because there are people here from Sri Lanka mm. who maybe want to comment on this. So I just wonder what happens when then there is no public um, public displays, you know, as mm. opposed to, as I think, I do, it, maybe this is a public display, what's yep. happening at Ilham, but there's another kind of thing which happens when there's something in a public space, you know, an outdoor space, I guess is, is what I mean. Yep. And I think there's a discussion about whether by suppressing this in, 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 in yes, in, in Sri Lanka, that then you only hear the government point of view, and I, I understand this is the fear that we always have, but in a way by the government not saying anything is as if they were never part of that narrative. This is just Malaysians not getting on, and that is the monumental thing that's being told to us that, well, we just don't get on as opposed to maybe this has been something that was a political act that needs to be, somebody needs to take ownership or responsibility for a political act. I mean, whether or not it was Razak or whoever, mm -hmm. but it was a political movement. Yep. Yeah. Um, I mean, to be honest, I, I completely agree in the sense that in an ideal world, I would, you know, I think of how important the June 4th protests are in Hong Kong and the fact that those protests happen every year so publicly in Hong Kong, I think is what has kept things alive there as opposed to you know, in China. Um, but, um, and I, I think that um, you know, up to very recently, the May 13th cemetery in Sungai Buloh was basically left to rot. And in recent years now, you actually see during um, festive seasons, during the anniversary of May 13th and during uh, Qingming, um, the graves are cleaned up. There are ceremonies being done. Um, but for now, I think, we are, I think we are gradually building to a point that perhaps one day we may be, open, be able to openly mourn May 13th. And I, I, I'm not even talking about seeking justice or accountability in terms of who started what, but I think we are at that place where even the ability to say I, I had someone who was lost to me and I mourn their passing, we're not even there yet. So I think that's probably where I would love to see us move to first. Um, and then after that, that's when things get messy. Uh, and I don't have an answer for how to navigate that messiness, to be honest. Any other questions? Okay. <laughs> Great. I think um, if, thank yeah. you so much. Oh, by the way, um, feel free to come up to the table and take a look, touch, feel. I mean, uh, they're not that delicate, but also don't be so rough with it. Lah. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, they're still junk, so to speak. <laughs> thank you very much.